are we going and where have we been? I'm Jay Leeming, and this is the Crane Bag Podcast. Today we're going to explore these questions. First, through the story of the Norse god Odin and his quest for wisdom. And then through a visit with a special guest, Eric James Dodge, who is a scholar of Indo-European culture. That would be the culture that predates all the European cultures we know of now. He has been exploring their ideas about the underworld, and he has some surprising things to tell us. Thank you for being here. Let us begin. One night, the god Odin had a bad dream. He dreamed that he was trapped inside a cave of red stone. But as he examined the walls, he found that they were soft and wet. And as he looked more closely, he found that he could see through those walls to the other side. And what he saw there was a forest of fir. And past that fir, he saw stars in the night sky. And as those stars began to go out, one by one, he realized that he was not inside a cave at all, but in fact inside the belly of a gigantic wolf. And a fist of darkness closed around him, and he screamed out, but that scream made no sound. And Odin awoke. He was in his royal bedroom, in his palace, in Asgard, the realm of the gods. His wife Frigg, the goddess, was beside him, still sleeping in the bed. The birds were singing their first songs. Odin stood up and he walked out of that bedroom and through his palace. And he went up a spiraling stair to the highest tower of that palace. And he came out to the top and there was a throne there that was open to the air. And he sat in that throne, and from there he could look out upon all the nine worlds of the universe. There were apples on the trees of Asgard. The sun was just coming up, spreading its golden light over everything. The green grass, the pear trees, the beauty of that place was resplendent and glorious. And then two ravens came and perched on his shoulders. Hu Yin and Moon Yin, thought and memory. And he gave a command, and they spread their powerful wings and flew off and through the nine worlds. And Odin went down from that tower and had a lovely day there in Asgard with the other gods. All of them went to Gladysheim, the hall of the gods, where they meet and sing songs and argue and tell stories and pound their fists on tables and drink mead all day long. But as they did this, the two ravens, thought and memory, flew through the nine worlds, and they saw all they could see, and they heard all they could hear. And when that day came to a close, when the wonderful sparkling raindrop on the edge of a leaf that was that day, when that raindrop was finished, when the day was over and the sun was going down, Odin returned to that tower and to that high seat on the top of that tower. And the two ravens came and landed on his shoulders. And in raven language, they spoke to him of all they had seen and of all they had heard. And one said, I saw a woman walking with a sword through a field. And the other, I saw a boat in a harbor and it was on fire. I saw an apple tree in blossom. I saw 40 men singing in a room. I saw a cow giving birth. I saw a great wind blowing a bush across a desert. I saw a woman opening a chest, and inside was a necklace the color of blood. I saw a sprout coming out of the dark earth into the light. So they told Odin everything they had seen. But nothing that they said explained to him his dream or told him if that dream was in fact a truth, a real thing that would one day occur, or if it was simply a silly fantasy of the night. And so he stood up from that high chair and walked down the spiraling staircase of that tower. And he went to the door of his palace and took his staff from its place beside the door. And he walked out and looked at the grass of Asgard, at the trees and the palaces there. The sun was going down. 
And then Odin began to walk. He walked across the grasses of Asgard. He walked past the apple trees there. He walked past the fortress of Thor, covered in spears and shields and strange flags. He walked past the palace of Eden, the goddess of all growing things. He walked past all the palaces of the gods, until at last he came to the great watchtower made of stone, the watchtower where Heimdall lives, the watchman of the gods. And beyond that place, there was the bridge of many colors, the sparkling, snarling bridge of voltage, many colors of light there, a rainbow bridge going out into the darkness. And he set his feet upon that bridge, he began to walk. And the bridge snarled and sizzled beneath his feet. And the stars far off hissed in the sky. And the darkness itself swarmed and gathered and spread itself out, coiling itself around the stars. He could hear the wind of the universe whistling in his ears. So he crossed that great bridge, and then that bridge came down to the ground, and it did so in a forest of oak trees in Middle Earth, Middenyard, where all of us live, with our coffee and our wheels and our broken spoons. And he wandered by night through Middle Earth dressed as a shabby wanderer in a ragged cloak. He kept mostly to the gutters and to the shadows, the alleyways of our world. And sometimes in a village, three rough men warming their hands over a fire they'd made out of a broken chair would be joined by a fourth, a traveler with a long beard and a gray hat. And this traveler would listen to their stories. But when they turned to ask him for his story, they discovered that he was no longer there. So Odin wandered through Middle Earth, listening, asking questions, and listening some more. And finally he came to the great tree itself, Yggdrasil, the tree at the center of all things, a gigantic tree. He could see it lit up in the moonlight and the starlight. He looked far up its trunk. He could barely see the glimmer of Asgard there in the highest branches, the realm of the gods. And then he began to walk down the side of this tree, this immense tree like a mountain itself. And sometimes the trail was a spiraling, dusty trail carved into its bark. And sometimes that trail had been whittled and worn away by the wind. And there were only rough handholds there. Sometimes he had to scale down the side of that great tree with his staff lashed to his back, feeling his way like a mountain climber, dangling down the cliff face his feet searching for footholds. But step by step, inch by inch, he made his way down that tree. And as time went on, he went past the realm called Jotunheimer. Jotunheimer, the realm of the Jotuns, the frost giants. And he passed the realm of fire, Muspel, and the realm of the dwarves, that mountainous place, and the realm of ice as well, until finally he came to a dark and tangled place. He came to the roots of that tree, like a thousand riddles spewing and tangling themselves out into the darkness. He followed one of those great roots, 
Down and down it went, curling like hair. Like the end of an old story or a new story about to happen, about to sprout into the air. Down and down he went, curling and spiraling around, following that trail. Until finally, he came to a realm of darkness and of water. He came to a great cavern, and he could hear the sound of dripping water. There was a great cave there, and there was a pool of water there. And slowly, he walked to the edge of that water. But as he stood there, a man came out of the shadows, a tall man dressed in black and silver and pale green. And he said, who goes there? I am Mimir, the guardian of this well of wisdom. Who are you, traveler? And Odin stepped forward, and in the starlight his face could be seen. And he said, I am Odin the All-Father, King of the Gods. I have come to this place. And Mimir said, Odin, Odin, your very self, you've come a long way, my friend. What brings you here? And for a moment, the dream of the wolf's red belly flashed before Odin's eyes, and he said, I seek wisdom. I wish to drink from these waters. And Mimir said, Well, Odin, drinking from these waters is possible. But anyone who drinks must first give an offering to these waters. And Odin looked at him and said, I will give you whatever you ask. That's what he said. He didn't haggle. He didn't bargain. He simply said it just like that. The god he was. He said, I will give you whatever you ask. And Mimir looked at him thoughtfully. I think you must offer up to these waters your left eye. And without hesitation, Odin took his fingers and dug them into his left eye socket. And he took hold of his own wet eyeball, and he twisted it and snapped it out of his head, and held it before him in his palm. And then he placed it in the waters of that well, and it dropped down into the darkness. And he stood with blood trickling from his eye socket. And Mimir took a great drinking horn from his belt, and he knelt and filled it up with that water, and he handed it to Odin. And Odin took that drinking horn, and he drank that crashing, sparkling water down into his bones. And as he did so, the memories of every man and woman who had ever lived entered his body. For it is said that when humans die, they go down to the underworld, and they cross the great river. And when they get to the other side, their memories are gone from them. They are but empty shells, just ghosts of what they were. They go off wandering in darkness. But their memories are not destroyed. Their memories go down into the water, and this flows into the well of wisdom. And not only men and women, but also animals as well, their memories too go into the water. So Odin felt flickering and rising in him millions of lives a carpenter measuring a board, a woman in childbirth, an old man weeping for his dead son, a frog in a bog, a bat flitting through a cavern somewhere, a hummingbird, a bee, even the dreams of the stones and the snakes and the butterflies and the bears in their long winter sleep, the jeweler looking at a jewel, a gem, a man on the battlefield facing death, laughter, joy, sickness, sorrow, all these things like a million thousand colors went flickering through his body. And in that moment, he saw again that red cave, the inside of the belly of the wolf. And he knew that that was a true vision. That was, in fact, something that would come to pass. And he saw Thor lying dead in a field. He saw all the gods dead in the field of Asgard. He saw fire covering their bodies. He saw fire devouring the strong oaken beams of Gladysheim, the hall of the gods. He saw smoke and ash rising from that ruin up into the sky, obscuring the sun. He saw the sun devoured by a great wolf. And then he looked, and there was Mimir before him. 
and there was the darkness of that cavern all around and the sound of dripping water. And Mimir said, Have you seen? And Odin said, I have seen. And Odin turned from Mimir, and he put his feet upon the path, and he began to walk. Once again, he followed a great root of that tree, up, up through the darkness, past the realm of fire, where Surt, the fire giant, waits with a flaming sword to claim Asgard for his own. And he walked past the realm of ice, and past the various underworlds down there, the realm of the dwarves. Up and up he went, scaling the side of that great tree, until he came to Middle-earth. And once again he wandered the paths and the alleyways of Middle-earth, the forests of that place, the tangled places, until he came to that great forest of oak trees. And there, in the darkness, glowing, he could see the Rainbow Bridge. Bridge of many colors, all of the spectrum was there, sizzling with voltage, and he put his feet onto that great bridge, and he began to walk. And once again, the stars hissed in the darkness and sang their old songs, and the fresh darkness itself spewed and rambled and writhed around the world, cradling each star in its mouth. Forward he went over the snarling bridge, and then, in the first light of dawn, he saw the Tower of Heimdall, for the sun was indeed rising and spreading its pink light over the world. Odin set foot on the green grass of Asgard. The birds were singing their songs. The apple trees were bright with apples. It was morning once again. And he walked across the fields of Asgard, past the pear trees, past the great palace of Eden, the goddess of growth, past the fortress of Thor, that fortress covered in spikes and shields and strange flags. And he went to the great hall of Gladysheim, and he went through the golden doors, and there was Frigg, his wife, to greet him there. And she threw her arms around him and embraced him. And the other gods were there as well. Thor, the god of thunder, Bragi, the god of song, Freya, the goddess of love and beauty. Eden was there with her golden apples. All of them were there. And they all gathered around a banquet table. And there was amazing food there. They had roasted an ox. There was apples of all kinds. There was pears. There were amazing baked goods. There was, it was resplendent, that table, with wine and food of all kinds. And the candles were lit, and they shone in the eyes of the gods and the goddesses there. And Thor said, Odin, we must have a toast. And Odin stood up and held his drinking horn in his hand, and all the other gods stood up as well. And Odin looked at all of them, and for a moment, as he looked at the brightness in their eyes, he remembered again the clench of the wolf's belly around him, and he saw again the ashes of that very hall of Gladysheim rising up into the sky, obscuring the sun. He saw Thor dead in a field. He saw all of them devoured by fire, their bodies consumed, turned to ash. But he looked at them now, their faces bright with happiness, glad to be there, the candles shining bright in their eyes. And he said, A toast to this moment. And all the gods answered him with their voices, and they drained their glasses, and they sat down to a wonderful, fantastic feast. And when that feast was over, when the god Bragi 
had sang his last song and put his harp away. When the plates were empty and their hearts and their bellies were full and content, all the gods went away to their separate palaces. And Odin and Frigg together walked across the grass of Asgard towards their palace. And they entered through the golden doors of that place and ascended the stairs to the royal bedroom. And they lay down in that bedroom and soon Frigg was asleep and darkness covered the world. And before long, Odin slept as well. And in that darkness, he dreamed. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Thank you for listening to this story, attending to this story, which is like a small flame. But if you cup it in your hands, if you shelter it and give your breath to it, perhaps it will grow into a larger fire by which we can see many things. By that firelight, we look around us and we see perhaps where we are. And where are you in this story? That's the question. For me, I find myself there with Odin giving his eye. Oh, youch. He gives his left eye to see. Well, to learn. But these two things seem related to me. I feel it, you know. He can see all these things, all these other lives, but he gives up that other eye. It's like he gives up an outer eye to see within. For me personally, where I go is uh, I got big glasses. I mean, I wear contacts a lot of the time. But along about third grade, I started being unable to see uh, the blackboard, for example. And so I wear glasses like lots of folks do in this world we live in. But what strikes me about this is that, that at that time in my life, I was seeing very intensely inside. So someone looking at me would say, oh, he can't see very well. He can't read the blackboard. But I could see very clearly in my head the things I made up and the things I recycled from the various movies I watched and the things I imagined. So I was seeing very well in an internal way, a visionary way, perhaps we could say. And I was not seeing the blackboard. I didn't want to see the blackboard. Man, that was boring. That's boring, people. Well, it was to me. And I've written things on blackboards since myself, and I've been inspired by things on blackboards. Let me just say that. But in that moment, third grade, there I am. I'm not digging it. I'm digging what's going on in my own head, which was monsters and spaceships, robots and castles, dragons and universes on fire, you know? I mean, hey, that's the stuff, people. Not the, uh, not the blackboard. Not how to spell uh, words. Not geometry. Not math. Uh, For me, that was my experience. Of course, your experience is different. Oh, listener, listening to this podcast, we we salute and love the difference. I wonder what your experience is. I would love to hear about it. If you ever want to email me, do so uh, via my website, jleeming.com. You can find my email address, leemingjjay at gmail.com. Blah, blah, blah. But anyway, in this moment in the story, that's that's where I'm drawn to. That's the moment that, that draws me in. Uh, because of my own history, I guess, of seeing and not seeing. Must you give up your eye to know all that stuff? Do you have to? 
I'd like it if we didn't. I'd like it if we didn't. But you can't do all things. Perhaps we must. Perhaps that is a deal I have made somehow without knowing it. Perhaps it's a deal you have made. We all look at the screen a lot these days. Is that the well of wisdom or is it not? Is it a kind of sleep? What is the well of wisdom? Is it internal? Is it something inside? If you've heard possibly my interview with Eric James Dodge, uh, which is on this website, uh, hopefully, um, you've, you've understood perhaps the link, uh, how this is an Indo-European idea, that the dead, the memories of the dead go into the well of wisdom and we drink from that. Or ch- certain chosen people, certain special folks, uh, poets, for example, uh, dreamers, get to drink from that well of wisdom. I find that an amazingly reassuring idea. It's an interesting sort of afterlife. You are a ghost wandering around, an empty shell, but your memories go into the great well of wisdom, and they live on in others, like the god Odin, who himself will not live forever. That's the wild, beautiful, sorrowful thing about the Norse world, right? Is that the gods die. And in this story, Odin learns that. He learns that his death is uh, likely, if not certain. And that gives him his sorrow. He's not exactly a joyful god. Zeus is a little happier, that's for sure. He's a little happier in his palace up there. And the Greek gods, we learn about their births, we do. The Norse gods, we don't quite hear about how they're born, many of them. Um, but we do hear how they how they die. And it's a beautiful, sad thing. Uh, especially as I say this now with autumn approaching around the corner in 2020. Um, who knows where you are, dear listener, in the wheel of the seasons? Who knows what uh, drink of, of flavors this universe is giving you in this moment? But may we drink those things down and learn from them. And the question is, does Odin's knowledge serve him? Is it just a source of sorrow or not? Is it a good thing or not? Seems like a good thing to me. I feel it's a good thing. But uh, how necessary is it? Is he able to stop anything? Is he able to make things better? Well, stay tuned. Uh, I hope to look at other Norse myths and perhaps we will find some answers to those questions. But you know, hang on. Let me add one more thing. And this is the bard in his stone house with the windows blacked out by sheepskins. That's an actual image uh, that comes from Ireland um, when folks wrote about the bardic schools in Ireland. The bards there would um, do exactly that. They would go to a dark hut and they would cover the windows with sheepskins and they would lie there with a stone on their chest and they would work on a poem. That's how they did creative writing. Now, I'm, I'm the product of a, well, not the product of, but I've been through a creative writing degree at the New School down there in New York City. And uh, yeah, I went through that. Um, but this is how they did so-called creative writing back then. It's how they wrote their poems. They went to a hut and lay down in the darkness with a stone on their chests. And they were there all night, and in the morning, they should have a poem. Now, the bardic tradition is not uh, what poetry looks like now in our country, uh, in our world. Um, There was a lot of memorization. There was all kinds of meters and stuff you had to follow. But nevertheless, the image of the bard in the dark uh, composing the poem is quite strange and quite lovely. And I bring that up just because of the way in which the world must be obscure, the way darkness is a requirement for creativity, perhaps, in that realm. Just as Odin gives up his eye, he refuses to see, he gives up his sight of the world to see inner things. These days, so many things are dragging us outside, meaning to the screen of our phones, of our laptops, out there. And the powers of reverie and silence and memory and imagination, that's where it all starts. That's where it begins, whether it's the plans for a building or a story 
or a new idea, uh, all kinds of things like that. They come from reverie and sleep and dreams. So may we honor and praise those powers and work in league with them, in harmony with them, as best we can. So now we're going to approach that realm of reverie and sleep and dreams and of ultimate knowledge from a different angle uh, by speaking with Eric James Dodge, who is a student of the Indo-European culture. That is the culture that predates all the European cultures we are familiar with in the present day. And he has been exploring their vision of the underworld. And I spoke to him some time ago. And here is an excerpt from that conversation. Let us go. So you've been studying a lot of things, but um, in particular, the Indo-Europeans, which uh, are the folks, well, you can tell me better than I can say, but the folks who lived in Europe way back, let's just put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, what, what inspired you to, to study them and how did you come to that? Uh, what's the background that brought you there? Well, I grew up reading a great deal of history and a great deal about uh, myths. And you know, like all other students, I've read um, Edith Hamilton's mythology and I started noticing that there were patterns that, you know, while Zeus has a thunderbolt, so does Thor. And so does the Vedic or you know, old, old Indian uh, Indra. They all have thunderbolts. And it was, only in t it was only when in college at the University of Houston for my undergraduate, I was in the classics department. And one of my professors, the head of the department, Casey Dewey Hackney, um, she had worked at the Center for Hellenic Studies, which is a, a, a department in Harvard under a scholar named Gregory Nagy, or Gregory Naj, but it's spelled N-A-G-Y. And she introduced me to the academic discipline, the, the, the rigorous um, and long standing um, academic discipline of Indo-European studies, which mm -hmm. basically um, looks at, it was originally a language group. So all of the languages of Europe, all the languages of um, well, uh, the Avestan of the Zoroastrians, which is in Iran, mm -hmm. and Sanskrit in Northern India, especially, in the Vedic old, old Sanskrit, as well as some various outliers like Tokarian that's way out in China that we know very, very little about. Mm -hmm. um, all of them are related, and they go back to, we believe, a single language. And along with, parallel to this language, there was a group of people who we've now known because of genetics, were in some ways connected along the patrilineal line. It's called your Y helpful group. They were marked by the Y helpful group R. Um, it gets complicated and you can't make generalizations. And these people varied, you know, the diversity of them is very high, um, especially because they're so spread out. They intermix with different people. And they're not really, they originally weren't a, really a single people. They were a variety of different tribes around uh, Ukraine, north of the Black Sea around the steppe, Pontic steppe area between there and the Caspian Sea. Mm -hmm. And there were a bunch of different tribes and they kind of conglomerated over time. And with the domestication of the horse and metallurgy, they kind of solidified into like this vague group culture, like the Scythians, how we think of them as kind of this vague area on the steppe. And they around 3000 BC going forward, um, started moving south and to the west, into Europe, into Iran, into Northern India. Um, and What's interesting about this is that we know nothing about them, <laughs> almost nothing about them, except their archaeological remains and whatever subcultures, whatever sub-branch broke off and established themselves in Greece or in Rome or in Germany, so forth. Those are the cultures that we know directly about and we have written records about, but we have no writing from these people. They're entirely oral. All of their history was told by poets, handed down, and memorized like the Iliad and the Odyssey. Those were poems which were memorized. They had various ways of doing it using epithets and formulas, but essentially they were memorized and uh, a lot of it was lost. Um, and it's really up to modern scholars and it has been over the past 200 years. Um, originally it was called Indo-Germanic studies, but now they call it Indo-European studies, which is a bit more kind of, it's a better phrase to describe it. Um, it's up to modern scholars to reconstruct their 
languages, culture, religion, everything about them. And so uh, Casey Duhackney at the University of Houston introduced that to me, and it's just captivated me ever since I learned that two years ago. So a lot of your work in, in connecting with these cultures is uh, linguistic primarily. Yeah, I, so the discipline was founded in linguistics. So pater, pitar, father, they all sound similar. The Indo-European, proto-Indo-European words for water was something like woder. Mm -hmm. um, their word for um, waste was kaka. Uh, their, waste, their word for mother is basically mother. It, and then father is pater, brother, swestor, um, and so forth. And so they, you can see how, uh, you know, how far back a lot of these terms go. And so that's where it started with linguistics. And then it kind of, the social anthropologists got a hold of it and religious studies people got a hold of it and started bending it towards trying to reconstruct what the religion is, looking at rituals, looking at um, more than just individual words, looking at formulas, looking at narrative patterns. And then also folklore comes into play. There was a lot of recent work done on what they call Indo-European folklore, which it gets complicated because folklore is, is so amorphous. It's so, you know, it's hard to pin down, but there are a lot of other things besides just words that we can, reconstruct and uh but yes it, a lot of it is very linguistic and if when i did my thesis for my undergraduate a lot of it is rooted in linguistics mm -hmm. well uh thank you for laying that all out um for me i'm inspired by the uh desire to find a, a healthy relationship to the earth of course because these days things are kind of a mess out there as many of mm -hmm. us are aware and um of course, many cultures have deeply rooted connections to the earth uh, that are very inspiring. Uh, myself, being descended from a variety of European cultures, uh, I'm curious about the uh, Indo-Europeans because they seem like the the ans they are the ancestor ancestors of European culture primarily. I think that's correct to say. So mm -hmm. I would wonder. I mean, in your recent work, what um what have you learned about their relation to to death and to the underworld in particular? perhaps mm -hmm. you could say. Um, and yeah, you're, you're right in saying that they really are the kind of the main European, you know, quote unquote, because there were basically three different groups in Europe throughout history. There was the um, uh, native uh, Paleolithic hunter gatherers, and then there was the Neolithic agriculturalists, the farmers who came in later. And then the last was the steppe people, uh, the Indo-Europeans, and, you know, filtered through the bell beaker culture, if any of the listeners know a little bit about archaeology. And so the thing is that the, uh, in certain areas, like in Britain, like 90% of the, the, the native population was totally eliminated. And the Neolithic dominated all, and the Neolithic peoples rather, they dominated all of Southern Europe. And um, nowadays, if you look at Europeans, they're mainly a mix between steppe and farmer. And so people in Northern Europe and especially Scandinavian people have a lot of steppe and then people in the South have more uh, Neolithic farmer types, uh, the percentages of their, their overall um, autosomal genome. So, uh, so it is really kind of a, a big part of our cultural consciousness. Um, as for the earth, I'd like to mention that they, uh, there's a lot of different gods you can reconstruct for the Indo-Europeans and one of them is, uh, Earth Mother. Mm -hmm. Her name was Degho Mater, and humans were a derivative of the first term, Degho, but they, they were called earthlings. And so we are children of the earth, of the mother. Um, but unfortunately, a great deal of that, uh, of the surrounding myths and notions, has been lost to us. And what we know is mainly, you know, kind of sky deities, um, not necessarily patriarchal, because there's plenty of female sky deities like Dawn and the sun goddess and some of the stars but uh we just we don't have a lot of um myths about uh, the earth in particular but what i found when i kind of researched into it for my undergraduate thesis was that the earth is associated primarily with the underworld um, and it's associated with darkness and uh moistness a great deal um and so in my thesis, what I did is I looked at a narrative, um, a narrative complex that has various kind of components to it about 
um, what happens when we die? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the myths, because there's many, because again, these, these people really weren't one single people. They were like a whole civilization that had, you know, a civilization has very many different little subcultures in it. And so one of the strains um, believed essentially that when we die, our souls go to the underworld and they have to cross a watery way, a river or a lake or a pond, usually a river. And when we walk through this, our memories are stripped from our bodies and they flow down the river deep into the underworld, into the center of the underworld at like the base of the Axis Mundi, the world tree of the universe. And it's there that there's a well or a fountain or some sort of pond, but usually a well. And they're, they pool there and they're collected and nobody can access them. What happens is our bodies continue across the river. They go across the river, they get on the, the far side bank of the river and they go off and they may be reincarnated. Um, work still needs to be done on that aspect of it. But what I figured out was that there are certain, well, uh, what one scholar, Bruce Lincoln, who I based a great deal of my work on, um, but I expanded on his work. That's been, he wrote an article and then I wrote this thesis. He wrote the article back in the 80s and this thesis was a response um, bolstering his argument. Mm -hmm. And I found certain little extra bits here and there that tacked on to the main myth, which he figured out was this, that there are certain people that can access these memories. And primarily, those are the poets. Also some warriors and kings, but it's mainly the poets who are able to access this through trance or through dreams or through you know, altered states of consciousness and uh, can extract the memory and sing them through song. And they can live again in, our, in his telling and in our hearing of the story. Um, and it's a religious ritual. Um, you know, when you read the beginning of the uh, Homeric poems or the Aeneid or et cetera, et cetera, it always starts with an invocation. Oh, muse, oh, memory, sing us this song, sing through me. Um, as if the poet's not really doing it. It's, it's the memories that are going through him. So I think that's, that's, that's the kind of the gist of it. There's other little things we can get into uh, yeah. later on. Yeah, thank you. But what, I think uh, that's the main reason that, um, uh, that that connects our work is is the the that the Indo Europeans had these stories of traditional myths, these narratives, these religious rituals of poetic storytelling, um, which we have lost almost all of. You can go to you know some parts of Eastern Europe a hundred years ago, and a little bit still today. You know maybe go to certain um, countryside in Greece and find remnants of this, but through, you know, the modern world in all of its economic systems and it's all of its philosophies and its materialism has uh, made us forget. Uh, we, we've, we've, you know, not done our duty in, in telling these tales uh, and uh, we're not, it's not for the better for our culture. The river of forgetting is now called Wi-Fi, perhaps, or I don't know. Yes, um, yeah. Television, something, movies, something like that. Yeah, it mucks up our consciousness. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, thank you so much for laying that out. Uh, what struck me right away as a storyteller is, you know, I've told the Orpheus myth, and I've also told mm -hmm. Norse myths, and um, the connection, almost like an electrical connection between these two uh, stories, uh, and it's where the, um, the dead, they cross the river of Lethe and they forget their lives. But then knowing that those memories go somewhere and uh, serve a purpose and are not just lost is tremendously reassuring and inspiring. Because um, mm -hmm. then I conceive of Odin, as you lay out in your thesis, as one of the fellows who would um, drink from the well and, and learn wisdom. So, so for me, I just find that great, you know, that our, it's, uh, it's a reassuring view of the cosmos in which our lives are not lost forever, but are part of the wisdom uh, that uh, poets and the future will draw on. Um, in your thesis, I think you lay this out, but the, the poets, now they gotta go down there. That's the trick. You know, you can't just, uh, <laughs> you need to descend um, and you need to go into trance of some sort, you're saying, but they go down and they come back, right? It's not as ghosts that they speak to our culture. They come back alive, is that mm -hmm. correct? Yeah, that is. They, they, are, they are unique. Um, and there's various, uh, a lot of the time it's hard to make generalizations because the way the proto-myth 
descended and evolved in various um, cultures, it's, they, they are almost totally different, but uh, they do have common threads. And so the idea is that they, they may go to a special location. They may um, put themselves in a certain state of consciousness like sleep or uh, lull themselves into thinking about memory through the music and it, it sparks um, not inspiration, it, but sparks memory. Um, I, I'm not sure that the modern kind of individual creativity notion really applies to their worldview. It's, it's very much that they build off of the old. When you look at the poems themselves, they describe the poet as number one, singing the imperishable fame. In Greek, that's the Kleos Apathetion. In Sanskrit, that's the Shra Avash Ashitam, Akshitam. Nice. Let's hear those words. I love the music of it. Can we just oh, hear right. one? Yeah, more? I can say it again. <laughs> uh, so the Greek is the Kleos Apithion, mm -hmm. and the Sanskrit, I don't know Greek, so I might be butchering that, but uh, the Sanskrit is Shravas Akshitam. All right. Thank you. And originally it would have been something like Kleos Negutitam, mm -hmm. and it means, means imperishable fame, and it has to do with warriors, but it's not just warriors. Like I said, like if you look at Greek plays, um, you'll find Medea, who is described in very similar formulaic language as, you know, Achilles or other characters. Um, but it is fame. There's a wonderful little poem in Old Norse that says, cattle die, friends die, and you're going to die too. But the only thing that doesn't die is fame, well known. Which That's that true. really gets to the point of how they, how they viewed history, which was as this um, primarily oral and popular you know, a, a popularist kind of um, thing. We should, I'm starting to jump in, but we should mention, of course, that, I mean, a poem uh, back then was something which happened. It was an event. I mean, mm -hmm. that's just to, to clarify that it's not, as you said, it's not something that's it's saved on paper forever because um, it's not a written culture. It's just an event which happens and the, the poet, but also the listeners are at the center of that event. And then it passes and maybe there'll be another happening later on, but it's not something preserved except as it is preserved in memory, I suppose, you know, as you're saying. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, you, you know that the audience would have said, oh, tell us a sad story. Or maybe they get really drunk and they're like, oh, tell us, tell us the really violent, bloody part. Mm -hmm. And maybe, maybe make it more bloody than last time. Um, <laughs> or let's do the romance part and let's make it a little spicier than last time, you know? So the, the poet, um, it's kind of this on-demand, always kind of present at the court, um, ready to fulfill the, the, um, kind of the entertainment of the listeners. And also, um, it, it's not always linear. You know, it's not like, like I say, the textuality gives this impression that poems have this like beginning, you know, it, like this section off kind of, I don't know, outline kind of form, but the, the way that they, it would have been a little more fluid, the beginning and ending of things, the, the way that they block text off. Mm -hmm. block the stories off. Maybe they change the story a little bit if they want to reflect, you know, something particular about the king that they're serving or to fit their audience. So yeah, it was very much something that happened to people. And um, the uh, Indo-Europeans, so their conception of the underworld, you go down, you uh, lose your memory, but it goes to the well of inspiration. Um, mm -hmm. And um, certain people can drink from that well. And um, so is it, uh, and what, and those certain people, they are trained poets, but, um, you know, so there also, there's also a certain amount of um, maiming and bodily trouble involved in this role. Is there not? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, Yeah, so this is the really fascinating thing. And so my interest in this aspect, because, I mean, just to mention a few other things, um, the poets, they would describe the poetry as the forging of a, of a weapon, basically, a forging of the words, like metallurgy. Mm -hmm. um, it's, at, you know, well, there's various versions. Um, or the uh, crafting a song, like, a, like riding a chariot. Or going back to the Penelope character earlier, the poet weaves it into a garment mm -hmm. um, or harnesses the song like a chariot again. Um, there's different, very di many different phrases. Uh, but one kind of minor thing, which I noticed and started with Odin, because Odin, he's this really interesting character who is this whole mishmash of different cultural influences from not, not just Indo-Europeans, but he has a lot of um, like uh, Sami and Finno-Ugric influences as well. Um, and so one of the things he does 
is he goes down to the well of memory to Mimir, Mimir's well, and he gives one of his eyeballs and he put it, puts it into the well as a sacrifice. And that's why he's one eyed, right? So he can see the past. That's the price he has to pay. Yeah, right. yeah. But one of the other things he does is he goes to the bottom of the world tree and he hangs himself from the roots at the bottom of the cosmos and peers into the darkness beneath and he stabs himself in his side with his spear. I believe it's called Gugnir. Mm -hmm. And through this kind of ascetic ritual, this uh, initiation ceremony, I suppose, he gains the power of the runes, which runes, you know, we think of the carvings, right? But the word runes, rune, originally meant mystery or secret or more exactly it comes from a proto-indo-european word which kind of means whisper the the whispering secret and so he learns this and these tales you know it's th this story is right next to one about the well of memory they, they are, they're all kind of his adventures to learn knowledge because that, that's what he was obsessed with was learning knowledge and so he learns this um, and gains the power of speech of, of sacred speech basically through his asceticism there's also this notion of uh i mean the good people and the bad people quote unquote you know does that oh, yeah. have a role in the indo-european view of who gets to go down there and who uh who forgets their lives and who does not uh, is morality a factor in this yeah um because that's the question everybody wonders they wonder are they going to go to heaven um, <laughs> when they die or is it just going to be a kind of gloominess right afterwards? Well, um, what I would say is that originally the Indo-Europeans, uh, Proto-Indo-Europeans, um, and I would ask that the uh, listeners please excuse any mistakes I make because there's a lot of kind of there's a lot of um, rigorousness that's expected of one in academia that you can do in writing, but it's a little hard to um, always keep up on when you're talking. But the Proto-Indo-Europeans, they probably didn't have a moral kind of consciousness in the way that we do nowadays where we're born and then we're told one of the first things is you better be a good little girl or a good little boy or you're gonna burn in hell. Or, you know, we're brought up in a family which doesn't do that and they don't teach us anything. And so we, we, we don't have any notion of morality other than popular opinion uh, and materialism and like maybe the good for the greatest number, but that's about it. But for the Indo-Europeans, what they had was a uh, fixation on fame and on renown. And that's not always moral. A lot of the Greek heroes, a lot of Celtic heroes, are, and all sorts of uh, Sanskrit heroes are not good people. They murder people indiscriminately on the battlefield. They go into um, terrifying trance states where they become wolf men and bear men. And they, one of them, I believe it's Cucullin in the Irish, he uh, would become such a raging berserker, such a bane from Batman that he would turn on his own troops. Uh, and so, but he was famous, but he was renowned, you know, and we'll sing his praises. And so uh, they, what would happen is there would be a section of the afterlife, which was not located in the underworld. It was located in heaven. Um, and if it was in the underworld, it was kind of its own little special place. Um, that was uncharacteristically bright and shining. So to me, that implies that it was originally in heaven and that it was, you know, uh, the warrior goes up there, he lives in this beautiful meadow and plain with cattle and uh, with the celestial deities and with the sky daddy, sky father figure. Mm -hmm. uh, and everyone else gets to go to the underworld, which is gloomy and dark. Uh, and there's various terms for it that, that describe its kind of, uh, not, not hellishness, that's not a hell. That's the thing we need to keep in mind is that most people aren't going, going to hell. They're going to limbo or they're going to the purgatory. They're going to a neutral place, a holding place or a, trend, a holding place for memory or a transition zone for rebirth in a new life or a new world or a new realm. Um, but it changed, obviously. I mean, we we... It, it changed not just with Christianity, which many people might think, they might think, oh, okay, so we, we now believe in morality. You know, we now believe in this kind of heaven and hell notion because of Christianity, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, you find it in Zoroastrianism, which Zoroastrianism, it began in Iran, and essentially it was a reformation of Indo-European religion. Um, 
And I don't think a lot of scholars frame it like that, but that is a good way to look at it because he, Zoroaster took Indo-European religious ideas and reinterpreted them and reorganized them into his own cult uh, that served the Persian empire. And it has a stark dualism of heaven and hell of a devil figure uh, whose name means like the angry mind mm. or the, um, the vicious mind. The angry and, mind. That's good. Yes. Yeah. They're very <laughs> cool. There's uh, various ones. The, there's the wise Lord um, or like the, 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 the mind of, of, uh, you know, good thought. And that's a Hura Mazda. But then there's Ungri Emanu, which is the, the evil, but it means like the, the angry, the, that's cognate with our word, angry mind. Um, and he's a liar. He, he has what's called the druge. He is the liar. Um, but uh, even before that, and this is the part where it intersects with Orpheus, in Greece, you had the mystery religions. Some of the viewers may have heard of the Eleusinian mysteries, the Dionysian mysteries. Well, one of them was the Orphic, which was uh, one of the very old ones. And all of a sudden, anybody could go to heaven. Anybody could, because the idea was that, like I said, in the Proto-Indo-European conception, everyone lost their memory when they crossed the river of forgetfulness. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden with the Orphic, we find gold tablets and tombs that say, if one wants to avoid uh, losing their memory and indeed wants to go and drink of the well of memory, they must follow these instructions. You must go past Hades' house and take a left turn. You've got to go down the river, take a right turn, and finally you'll arrive at the well. And there's going to be a guardian there, and you're going to need to give him this password. Mm -hmm. um, you find this notion of passwords, it reoccurs again and again. Here in America, we have um, Mormonism, and uh, in kind of traditional Mormonism, they have to learn passwords uh, to mm -hmm. get into heaven and certain handshakes and all sorts of stuff, which comes partly from um, Freemasonic influences into the, into the religion very early on. Um, but it's, it's this idea of passwords to the afterlife has persisted a long time and it's been a central part of mystery uh, institutions. I don't know, I don't wanna use the word cult or religion or anything like that. I think in mystery institutions or institutions that have mystery aspects to them, like Mormonism, like Freemasonry, like all of the ancient mm -hmm. mystery cults in Greece. And so, um, these, these people that had these gold tablets, the patella tablets, one of them is called the patella tablets. Um, they were just like regular people. They, they, I mean, they were, they were wealthy enough to afford the gold. So they were definitely a part of the upper crest, but they may have been merchants. Um, who know? I, I need to read up on who they were exactly, but they, they were not uh, your traditional kind of temple initiates like the Eleusinian mysteries or so forth. Anybody really could be an Orphic. Um, mystery and they're described as going from door to door with the books of Orpheus and trying banging on the doors and telling them, have you heard of our Lord and Savior Orpheus? Wow. Um, you know, very similar concept, right? It's funny how history repeats itself. But, but, but to go back to your question, uh, for them, they could attain heaven then. And it was through not renown, not fame, but through the following of Orphic precepts. Um, Orphism is connected to things like vegetarianism, mm -hmm. uh, certain sexual morality, mm -hmm. a purity of life, notions about killing and so forth. Um, and so if you follow these precepts and you know, maybe if you pay your dues to the religion, uh, then you'll get to know the secrets of the underworld. Mm -hmm. and, but it's not a big radical change. You can see how that it developed off of old ideas and just kind of rearranged them and opened them up a little bit. Mm. And it wasn't until the ultimate mystery religion, the, the, the penal ultimate one, Christianity, mm -hmm. that everyone was able to become a part of the mystery and become part of the, um, you know, the road to heaven and have a kind of moralistic and very dualistic view of it. All right. Well, we're going to take a short break. And here is some music from Iceland, of all places. Iceland, the source of fire and ice, the place where Snorri Sturluson wrote down all the myths he knew uh, back in about 1200. And the place which has generated music such as this. 
Fagra kvelið gillir grunn, glatt með þel að vanda. Nú því gel ég að ringa rund, áttin vel stíganda. Misjafn rómur mærðar er, misjafn dómar falla. Syngja óma haugar hér, hrafnar og lómar gjalla. Misjaft kjörin mærðar hljóm, metur fjörug þjóðin. Syngur hver með sínum róm, svona gjörast hljóðin. Sumir grunda guðleg ljóð, gæfu skunda línu. Vístóm stunda og vel hjá þjóð, verja pundi sínu. All right, that was Steendor Anderson, who has done uh, much work to uh, enliven the ancient Icelandic art uh, known as Rimir, R-I-M-U-R. He is chanting uh, very old poems in a uh, beautiful and traditional way. Music from Iceland by Steendor Anderson. Well, we are talking to Eric James Dodge, a student of Indo-European language and culture. And let us get back to that. I love all these ideas. Do you feel they can help us understand who we are and where we're at now? Or is it just a really interesting trip to an essentially alien world? Well, that's, that's a thing that I've thought a lot about in my personal life. The main thing I've gotten out of it is that it's uh, vitally important for us to be conscious of them for our own happiness growing up as children. If I didn't have things like Tolkien and Harry Potter growing up, um, I would have, I mean, that, that was basically a substitution for old fairy tales. I read some fairy tales, but not many. Um, but I'm so happy that I was able to experience Tolkien and Harry Potter and things like that, because if I hadn't, I mean, I would have lost out on the, the, the collective consciousness of, of our, of our, being. Um, I, we, I would have been fed basically just modern garbage. Um, and not only for children, for adults, uh, knowing that we have some sort of connection, whether it's mediated by a poet or a shaman, um, we have some sort of connection with our ancestors and with memory and with time that we have some sort of uh, context to our existence um, that isn't, you know, terribly uh, demanding on us and isn't this constant guilt or sense of shame or sense of um, tension that I get from personally I get from Christianity I'm certain there's many people that that feel the opposite but for personally for me I get that feeling mm -hmm. and so uh, in myth I find that kind of freedom of um, mythic context to my life mm -hmm. and a sense of connection with my ancestors that uh, I can't get anywhere else. And I think it's so important for children, especially to be raised with kind of a, at least some sort of consciousness of that. Mm. I think Europeans have a little bit more of that, especially like Northern Europeans. I know there's a lot of people that were raised with, you know, stories of, you know, Norse myths or uh, Slavic uh, myths in Eastern Europe um, that we just don't get here. We don't have a sense of history here as much in the United States. When we we have such a disconnection from, like you said earlier, from the earth, from our ancestors, from any sort of mythic context, mm -hmm. um, that it's really important for us uh, to put that effort in for our children uh, so that they can pass it on. Because we have to, it, basically, I would say to answer your question is that it's our duty, I, I believe, to rekindle the flame um, of whatever culture we come from, um, of culture and of mythic culture in general. 
that it's our, our duty to kind of bring that back because something went terribly, terribly wrong in the past few hundred years. Mm -hmm. uh, and I may not know, you know, we don't always know the answer, but we know the direction that we need to be going with it. So it is. I noticed you uh, dedicated your thesis to the cowboys of the ancient past. Can you say something about that? About oh, it? yeah, yeah. At the, at the beginning, I say um, I dedicate this something like I dedicate this thesis to those ancient cowboys mm -hmm. uh, whose descendants, language and uh, cultures cover the earth because uh, they were primarily um, cattle herders who rode horses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they, I mean, they have myths about putting horseshoes on your door to protect it, which, mm -hmm. you know, my great grandparents did in Kansas. Yeah. So it's very old traditions that mm -hmm. have come down to us. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and the cool part about that is that they've been reborn mm -hmm. here in America because they kind of died in Europe. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people weren't cattle herders or, or, you know, horse riders, unless they were part of the aristocracy or like mm -hmm. people in Spain, like, but in America with the frontier people who lived in sod houses, like my great grandparents mm -hmm. uh, in, you know, Kansas, Nebraska, Nebraska, Oklahoma, um, all of a sudden that kind of really ancient aspect of our culture was rekindled again mm -hmm. through American culture. I've been speaking with Eric James Dodge, a student of Indo-European culture. You can find his work online. His first name is Eric, E-R-I-C-K, James Dodge. And you've been listening to the Crane Bag Podcast. Thanks to the Patreon supporters who help make this possible. If you're able to join them, please do so, because uh, we want this to keep happening. Things happen in stories, and they happen in the world. And sometimes those are the same thing. And this podcast has been happening, and we want it to keep on happening the way a river happens, the way a bird happens over a forest. And the sun and the moon happen each day to us, standing here in the wild turf of our lives in this moment. Thank you for listening, and and take care. And I should say, oh, before I say take care, there is more stories. There are more stories at jayleeming.com, J-A-Y-L-E-E-M-I-N-G.com. Thank you. Thank you. Remember the egg at the center of the universe. Take care.